Okay, good morning, everybody. I think we have a small audience here because um, COFO continues, but I hope we have a large audience online. So my name is Julian Fox. I'm from the forestry division and I, um, I'm the team leader of the National Forest Monitoring Team. And this morning, our job is to get you excited about data and digital innovation for forestry. We'll do this with some presentations from FAO member countries, Ethiopia and Indonesia on their work on forest data and how they're using digital innovation to build robust national forest monitoring systems and how these systems are helping them achieve their forest goals. The forest goals we have been discussing a lot this week, reducing deforestation and degradation, restoring forests and enhancing sustainable forest management. You will then hear about the latest digital innovations coming from FAO Forestry Division to help you, the member countries, create better data to achieve your forest goals from FAO's Open Forest Initiative to CEPAL to potential applications of blockchain. We hope the session will inspire you. You know, there's a myth that uh, the foresters are not the most innovative people. You know, we, we tend to hang out in the forest and um, but I think our collective objective this morning is to prove this myth wrong. We are innovative, and you will see many examples this morning of how we are using digital innovation and data to achieve the forest goals that we've been discussing this week. Actually, we have so much to present on data and digital innovation, we have a full session. So without further ado, I would have invited Ms. Tina Vahanan, the Deputy Director of the Forestry Division, to provide some opening remarks. But as you know, COFO is ongoing and Tina is busy in the plenary. So I will briefly present um, Tina's presentation, if we can go to the first presentation, which I see right here. Actually, I have control. Fantastic. So there is a COFO information note on this exact topic it describes in fairly dry terms what we are talking about today. And I think our job today is to color this information note with examples from countries, um, some exciting new possibilities and get you all excited. But there is the information note that is available to member countries and um, you're welcome to, to read that as background to this event. I mean, digital innovation in FAO-led forestry data collection, reporting and dissemination contributes to our strategic framework, which is new, and uh, the science and innovation strategy and this, the strategy on climate change, which are all new. And uh, FAO broadly sees digital innovation as a key accelerator of the, of the organization. And they, oh, I can drive it from here. So I think as we all know, um, relevant, accurate, up-to-date and transparent information on forests contributes to better reporting, policy formulation and decision-making at global, national and local levels. The, you know, the classic saying, you cannot manage what you cannot measure. At the global levels, there are many examples of digital innovation in, in reports that are published by the Forestry Division, such as the Global Forest Resources Assessment, the Falstat Forestry, FAO Yearbook of Forest Products, the Global Plan of Action, and the State of the World's Forest Genetic Resources Reports. FAO's working capacity development at different scales includes support on this, on reporting, on forest monitoring, on measurement reporting and verification, and the generation of local data. The development of tools and platforms, and, and you'll see in a minute, um, the Forestry Division has been leading on this across FAO, the, things like the Open Forest Initiative, the open access FRA platform for the first time, the hand-in-hand -hand geospatial platform um, have provided new opportunities for foresters and practitioners to leverage the best available methods, data for forest and land measurement and monitoring. So some current and forthcoming work on digital innovation. This is, uh, these are the, the tools that we have under Open Forest. I wasn't expecting this slide, but uh, you'll see them there, eight wonderful tools. And we'll talk a bit, I'll talk a bit more about this in a moment. Um, we have Arena, and I'll, I'll introduce some of the new concepts in Arena, which is our cloud-based platform to support national forest inventory. We'll hear about CEPAL, which is our cloud-based geospatial processing, processing platform. 
And, and just to show you the, the online portal for the Global Forest Resources Assessment, which is, of course, one of the Forestry Division's key um, products. We, we are not resting, though. Now we are turning to support the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. And from the Forestry Division, we are leading the work on monitoring progress. And you'll hear a bit more about that. FAO has developed a hand-in-hand -hand geospatial platform. Um, which brings together, I think, over a million data layers across the different technical divisions of FAO, as well as uh, tools for, for the members. And it's been quite a revolution in the last two years under the leadership of the chief economist, Maximo Terrero, that this uh, working in close collaboration with the IT division and all technical divisions to make this platform a reality. And yeah, just to mention, I mean, exciting moment in FAO that, uh, that all the work around open data, open source um, tools and platforms is now becoming mainstreamed. And we call these digital public goods. And FAO has formally joined the Digital Public Goods Alliance to, to formalize this across the organization. So some future aspects, of course, is to is to take the full potential of these possibilities to support transparent reporting of forest level statistics at all levels, um, with the, supporting their strategy on climate change and continuing to build that science-based evidence which forest management um, so, so desperately depends on. From the division, we'll continue developing proven tests and modern innovative technologies under the Open Forest Initiative, the hand-in-hand -hand geospatial platform for forest data collection and dissemination, and what we call the FIRM, the Framework for Ecosystem Restoration Monitoring Platform for Restoration Monitoring. And we'll do a lot of uh, capacity development uh, as, as we develop and operationalize these tools. So thank you very much for joining us. I, um, without further ado, I would like to get straight into the first presentation and invite um, Mr. Heru Sabrala Ahmed, who's the Director of Forest Resources and Assessment and Monitoring from Ethiopia, to speak about forest resources and assessment and monitoring in Ethiopia. I invite you to the podium, Heru. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Julian Fox. Good morning. Just my presentation uh, focuses on experience of Ethiopia on using uh, these open forest tools for land use land cover and forest monitoring. Here are the three areas of application that we have uh, applied these open forest tools. The first one is the, the national forest inventory, second for mapping, Third, for sample-based area estimation without mapping. Out of these uh, world-class tools of open, open forests, we almost most of them we applied. We have been applying these tools, as you see, the ticked ones. For example, for the National Forest Inventory, we applied two of them: collect for data collection and a data entry and open for its calc for uh, data analysis, including uh, SAICO. For activity data, we have been applying these tools, these very special tools, SEPAL, and collectors online together with, in, uh, in, uh, together with Google Earth engine. Of course, some four years before, we have been using collectors, but now I think the collectors online is the advanced version of collectors, so we are we stick to collect to using collectors online. Here are some products so far we exercised. For example, for these periods, we produce some forest uh, forest change maps and forest cover maps for the current years. And on the other hand, we produced some land use land cover maps, change maps, forest cover change maps, forest cover and land use land cover maps for current years. All these maps are produced using these tools. 
let us see, for example, say application of SEPAL. For SEPAL, uh, we use three functionalities. For example, image preprocessing and mosaicing, which is the most important and time-saving activity using the traditional way of mosaicing. And the next one is training data collection is other functionality that we applied for these two analyses. One is the first is national, the second is for red plus monitoring. The second means the map with the right on the right hand side. And the third, the classification algorithm or the classification functionality of the SEPAL, and we produced maps like I presented before. We followed, there is very important approach, or uh, we followed the approach of GF, GFY guiding principle number one for remote sensing. This, I called this principle VVIP, very, very important principle to me, because it states that when mapping forest or land use land cover change, especially change, it is generally more accurate to detect change by comparing images rather than comparing maps. Experts throughout the world, I think, and in Ethiopia also, most remote sensing experts detect change using mostly comparing the two maps, which is actually not wrong, but less accurate, because when we are comparing two images, two maps for detecting a change, we are multiplying error, error of each of the maps. So the most important principle uh, is this one. So in order to realize this principle, we used SEPAL. As far as I know, SEPAL is the ideal tool for this. It is a powerful tool. That is why I stated there, it is a magic tool. Yes, it is, for me, it is a magic because uh, it compares images. So let us see the interface. I don't want to uh, bother you with just putting technical things, but how we have been applying the principle. Imagine the principle is comparing image to image. The image, the pictures at the bottom for uh, 2018 and 2022 20, are not maps, they are images. If you look at carefully, around the cursor there is a change. For example, forest land converted to cropland. So the algorithm detect, detected well, as you see, the red one is the change area. The same procedure for forest land remaining forest land, the stable classes, when we classify. As you see, it is clearly captured, the forest remaining forest. When I go to the other tool collectors online, we applied for the two analyses that we, I presented you before. For one, the left hand side is the national assessment. The second is uh, the uh, red plus project areas, monitoring for that areas. We collect the most important applicability for map accuracy assessment. The, the applicability of the collectors online is for map accuracy assessment and for uh, sample based area estimation. So here we used to collect reference data on this tool. The second application is application of collectors online is for sample based area estimation without mapping. This year, immediately uh, um, before a week, we concluded data collection of this some 93,000 plots. Uh, it is a huge plot number for one province called Oromia Regional State. This is for the sake of uh, determining the relative performance of administrative units below the province, which are, we, we call them zones. So mapping all for these all 21 zones is uh, not, will, be, will take much time, much resource and so on. So we selected this sample-based area estimation for that purpose. So we, for this purpose, we created two collectors online interfaces or uh, platforms because CEO can't afford samples before beyond 50,000. That is why 44, 45 and 48,000 
we created for two platforms. In general, we created so far many projects, CEO institutions and projects under them. All these, for example, these are the three ones. I am an admin for these all tools, uh, platforms, and there are many users or data collectors, 31, 5, and 16 for these three. And here are, for example, survey questions. That, uh, for example, here we have four qu survey questions. The first one is uh, the displayed one, and so on. And then in, we, we have been interpreting each, each of the points. When we come to the advantage of these tools, I don't know, I, have, I don't have much words about to, to talk about the advantages. They have been helping us for collecting relevant, up-to-date, transparent information on forests, which helps us better reporting and decision making. But at least I have one picture to compare. Believe me, this picture is true. This distinction or distinction or difference is true. I I have I took some time to fetch this figure because I was very happy, and I am strongly satisfied on these tools. They are so without these tools, it is almost a burden or a dunk work. Otherwise, using these tools, life is simple in terms of remote sensing. The reason or the the success, the, the reason for behind the success of all these successes is not only the provision of these tools, but most importantly, the technical assistance that we received, especially from FAO Forestry Division, Geospatial Team, and Spatial Informatics Groups, US Forest Service, and the like. To be honest, it looks like just we are working in the same office, in the same building, in the same floor, in the same just room. Yes, I can't say that. I can't just describe like that. I mean, from our side and from these uh, partners. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Hiro. You're very kind, and I really like the reference to CEPAL as a magic tool. That's, uh, that's wonderful. Now, we're really honoured to accompany countries such as Ethiopia on your journey toward better data. So thank you so much for that presentation. Um, I would like now to introduce Dr. Bal Belinda Magono Arunawati, who is the Director of the Forest Inventory and Monitoring of Forest Resources uh, from the Ministry of Environment and Forestry of Indonesia. I invite you to the podium, Belinda, to present um, how your robust national forest monitoring system is supporting Indonesia's ambitious plans. Thank you, Belinda. Okay. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank to have this opportunity. So I would like to start with the presentation, maybe a bit different what the experience have by Ethiopia. Uh, the title of our presentation is related to the robust national monitoring system, uh, specifically for uh, Volunet Sing 2030. As uh, a couple of days ago, Indonesia uh, released uh, the Indonesian state uh, forest of, uh, for uh, year uh, 2022. That is the book that actually explaining about uh, our uh, condition of forest uh, resources. So actually by, by releasing this uh, data, this uh, book, uh, we also would like to highlight that uh, we are focusing also in trying to uh, be part of reducing the emission from our earth. So with this, uh, I would like also to start that this is something related to the specific condition of Indonesia. We use the term of forest cover. That's the one that we generated from the remote sensing. And the other one is about forest area or forest status. That is actually the one that designed it for forestry purposes. I just want to highlight because I think uh, uh, many countries have the specific condition like this too. 
Uh, next, uh, this is something related to uh, general policy action for value uh, sector toward the sink. There are a couple, but I will only highlight the last one, the strengthening of uh, value sector database. So that's the one that actually why we are here, because in terms of the innovation, we also have to deal with the data and information. Uh, you don't need to read all of this, but at, this is give uh, uh, information that actually when we deal with the policy of pollinating that is forest and other land use uh, in order to be uh, a sink uh, by year 2030, uh, we have a couple of activity mitigation action, uh, but with all of this uh, activity, we need to have uh, very strong data and information. It could be from the remote sensing and also combined by uh, fit measurement. As I you see here, actually there are two main data that we and when we deal with the uh, uh, climate change. The first is about the activity data, and then the second one is about the emission factor. The activity data is actually the one that we generated from the remote sensing. Uh, we don't use directly the tools provided by FAO, but we built uh, our system also with the support from the FAO. A couple, uh, maybe t 25 years ago or 30 years ago, we, we worked together in establishing uh, this uh, uh, remote sensing uh, monitoring system as a prototype. And the system is actually also accompanied with the National Forest Inventory, so the activity on the ground uh, to also collect all of the data and information and providing the information on the emission factor. All of this activity is also uh, developed together with the FAO, so thank you FAO for all of this uh, with the prototype and so on. But nowadays we already have uh, the system under the government running operationally and we call it national forest monitoring system and this system is actually the one uh, we would like to support uh, to achieve the volume net sink 2030 so we have 12 uh, mandatory uh, mitigation action that is the one that actually we want to uh, support uh, using the data and information we have so far <coughs> This is how we produce the activity data by using remote sensing. This morning I have also um, a technical meeting and I told our colleague here with NFAO that actually for Indonesia, we don't work together. So collaboration is also one of the key. Uh, the collaboration here is not only with many uh, act, uh, donor or many um, uh, stakeholder outside, but it's also within the country itself. So in terms of this monitoring system, the Ministry of Environment and Forestry doesn't work to, uh, alone, but it's also work with other uh, government institutions. This is the, this picture here is actually just explaining the color, uh, explaining how many uh, institutions that actually be part of the activity. And all of this uh, flow is actually producing what we call it the land cover map of Indonesia. It's 23 classes right now uh, because we use also the visual one. So it's not directly automatic, but why are we doing that? That is also because of uh, depend on the need in the country. Uh, this, uh, this is telling the story about the history, why we have the 23 classes. There are six periods we've been uh, through so far. And the first period, we work closely with the FAO. And then we have also tried to improve everything, every period. And nowadays, we also uh, use uh, technology, innovation with the vegetation. That is actually the alert for uh, change. Uh, deforestation, reforestation, and so on, and also something related with the monthly burn scar. I will talk about this one, and also related to providing uncertainty uh, data, uncertainty analysis for the monitoring system. This is how we see from the uh, National Forest Monitoring System. In Indonesian language, we call it Simontana. Uh, so maybe if you uh, if you have CEPAL, we have this one. Uh, this uh, system actually provides all the statistical information 
every year and also giving the information related to land cover trajectory so we know it was from what and now changed into something else uh, there is also a tools about the digitization the vegetation that is actually the deforestation early warning system uh, we are still also working with this and i'm open to work with fao also to make it uh, perfect and the underneath is actually the result about the deforestation in indonesia you can see in the past when we have uh, not yet uh, technology seems like the deforestation is very very high it could be because of the situation is like that but it could be also because of the technology is not proper enough but when we see after years of 2000 everything it's getting better because the technology uh, it's uh, suitable enough to provide proper information uh, this is actually the result we have uh, from the graph if you want to see the digital uh, appearance like this on the top is the year of the data and the underneath is actually about the accuracy the accuracy of the information itself from 90 uh, it was three years and then start 2011 becoming yearly because we use landsat and landsat is becoming free when uh, in 2009 that is also the reason why we have uh, the system becoming annual and for this we also open to work with many partners to improve uh, the quality of the information we have and now try to uh, attach a bit about the forest fire maybe the underneath uh, that is the result of uh, how we monitor the forest fire in indonesia actually the specific system to count uh, the area of uh, the for uh, the forest fire start in 2015 but then we try to make it backward using the same methodology using the archive data so we establish the method and try to make it the data available and you can see here that is the series of the uh, uh, forest fire in indonesia and there is a different about the mineral soil and the peatland so we can see the different color of the graph showing uh, maybe it's too small but i had uh, i hope you can see the different and the pie chart underneath is actually explaining that the fire is not directly linked with the forest fire back in the country the fire could be on non-forest area and also the forest area we can see it's only four percent so far under uh, on the forest area and the other one is about non-forested area <clears throat> uh, this is related the uh, national forest inventory the one that provide uh, the uh, emission factor so we have the systematic sampling for the entire country it's about uh, 300 plots so far uh, that is a systematic one and that we are still working with the FAO how to make it more effective more efficient because it's so costly to have uh, about 3,000 plots systematically around uh, along the country and we have to measure uh, repeatedly every five years but yearly we also try to get this one we are working on it how to make it more effective and efficient and provide the emission factor that link directly to the data activity this is the side result uh, from the nfi uh, giving the map of standing volume that is one of the uh, output we have uh, for uh, indonesia forest and the other one is the standing biomass so this is give information for us to know where is the high biomass and where is the low biomass and this is the last slide i think this is to say that innovation yes we use uh, remote sensing we have uh, gis also to provide so many thematic map for the country but we need also to have something in how to combining all the geospatial uh, in, uh, maps uh, together uh, to the uh, decision um, uh, making a process so we make the data all available here we use a technology we try to make uh, as a note so every institution in the country is also connected to each other there is a concept of custodian data there is also concept of producing data so who create 
who make the data, who will update, how frequent, and so on. That is one of the uh, approach that we use so far. And we try. We already have the national geospatial information network in the country, and hopefully we will improve the quality of this uh, as soon as possible. With this uh, challenge, uh, this is just give. Uh, what the problem we have so far is because the Indonesia is quite large country and about because the environmental and forest management planning is required the financial resources I think everybody have that problem the human resources so the capacity building is also the most important research sometimes if we are dealing with the operational we don't have time to do the research so we need to have the partner to do the research exactly uh, following what the need that's the thing and also the consolidation and the coordination and also the need for monitoring reporting uh, verifying and also controlling with this i would like to close the presentation hopefully it's not too long thank you julian thank you everyone Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Belinda. I, I found that really inspirational, actually, that, um, you know, you demonstrated that that continuous improvement has led to higher levels of accuracy and transparency and, and higher levels of ambition. And, and now you have, you demonstrated how that helped you in the past. And now you have this incredible follow net sync 2030 plan. So congratulations to you in Indonesia. Belinda actually needs to go dash to the airport at 11. So with that in mind, I would like to pause and take any burning questions from the audience because we're, we're doing a great job on timekeeping. So would anybody like to ask a question to either Ethiopia or Indonesia or should we keep steaming on ahead? I see no hands, so let's keep steaming ahead. Thank you, Belinda. I think. Sorry, you're going to get quite a bit of me today, unfortunately. <laughs> so I am, I am back, and um, I'm going to say a few words about uh, the Forestry Division's work. And, um, and I think you've already seen a very nice application in, in Ethiopia from uh, Dr. Haru. So how do we work as the Forestry Division? Well, we have two teams that really work in synergy. We have the Global Forest Resources Assessment that compiles, you all know the FRA, it's one of our um, key activities in the division. It compiles all the national statistics about forests. And then we have my team, the National Forest Monitoring Systems team, that supports governments at the national level, on, on national level needs, national level data production to support their national forest goals. And we really, it's a very nice, I see it as a circular economy. You know, we, both teams, we use the capacity development, the digital innovation and partnership to improve the quality of the data in the countries to help them achieve their forest goals, which then ends up in the FRA and, and hopefully provides uh, good news, uh, such as the example provided by Belinda today. Uh, my team, we support satellite land monitoring systems, national forest inventory, as, as presented by Belinda, and greenhouse gas inventory, so bringing together the field inventory and the remote sensing data into an inventory and a forest reference emission level, which has been a, um, I'll talk about it in a moment actually. So as I mentioned before, we have Open Forest. It was launched in 2011. At the time, it was one off, if not the first uh, open source project in FAO. And I, I, it wasn't me that launched it, but colleagues that did were, were trailblazers, I would say. Um, the beautiful thing about it now is that it's, it's I term it as it's future-proofed because over its 11-year uh, history, different donors have contributed, different projects have existed, but because it's all open source, it continues to grow by itself. And you know, the countries are picking up different pieces. Some countries take their own, take this open cord, code, sorry, and integrate it into their national forest monitoring systems. And it's really evolved from quite a small open source project in 2011, now to cover all elements of forest data collection, analysis, and reporting both field-based and remote sensing. And it's um, amazing to see in the last two years that this approach has been mainstreamed across FAO. So open source digital public goods are now a core, a core work area of FAO from being quite an isolated project in the forestry division, very innovative at the time, 
Um, now we see this, these tools and the approach is really mainstreamed um, across FAO. So we have many users, many countries, and I mean, we don't intend to replace what a country has. We just tend, we intend to fill in the gaps, those specific needs through technical assistance and these digital tools allow us to do the technology transfer really effectively. It also has removed dependencies. You know, um, some development projects would, uh, would build uh, computer labs, would buy expensive software. Now we don't have to buy expensive software. So there's no dependencies in the countries. It's all free and open and has a, uh, has a life shelf of its own. This is a really nice use case of, of how these tools have, have uh, accelerated progress under Red Plus, which I hope I don't have to spell out the acronym and I hope you all know what it is. But under the UNFCCC, we've seen incredible progress over the last 10 years in, in countries being able to submit forest reference levels. Many of these countries, this is the first detailed forest report that they've submitted to an international convention. So it's no small feat. And we, against these reference emission levels, we have 27 red plus results. And I mean, from FAO, we're just delighted that 90% that of these countries used our tools, right? We, they used them to fill the gaps. They used them to, to help them create good data and then report to the convention. That is uh, quite remarkable. And this isn't just hot air. These are, uh, these are then assessed uh, by the UNFCCC. And we have over 11 billion tonnes of CO2 reductions or enhancements under Red Plus. And a nice segue to the next session. This has helped, helped the countries mobilise almost half a billion dollars worth of climate finance under the GCF. And I, every, all this movement is really accelerating our forest goals, what we've been talking about this week. Reducing deforestation and forest degradation, enhancing forest carbon stocks and facilitating sustainable forest management. So now we turn to a new decade, and it's the decade on ecosystem restoration. So one really nice thing from my point of view is that we're taking all this knowledge, uh, the tools, the capacity, and we're turning it to monitoring the progress of ecosystem restoration. And we're doing this by building on FAO's hand-in-hand -hand geospatial platform. We've created a version of the hand-in-hand -hand geospatial platform on FAO's core geospatial architecture called the FIRM, the Framework for Ecosystem Restoration Monitoring. And it's really a nice integrated platform for monitoring the progress of the decade. And uh, you'll hear much more about this, I hope, in the coming years. But we are building up to having good area-based data for the progress of the UN decade, and also hopefully um, supporting the CBD's Global Biodiversity Framework Target 2, which is going to, in December, hopefully agree on a really ambitious target for restoration under the CBD toward 2030. So one of our core areas of support, I think, right from when FAO was first created, was support on national forest inventory. And this, this continues as a core area of work for us. And uh, these are the different steps and that we're currently supporting many countries, including Indonesia, on, the, on different steps in this cycle. Our tool um, for supporting national forest inventory has evolved. Um, as we know now, it's not so easy to install software on a, on a computer, so we're trying to move our tools to the cloud. And Open Forest Arena is an example of that, where we have taken Open Forest Collect open forest calc and we've put them into this cloud-based environment that's secure to allow the countries to, to do things without having to install any software. And the open forest arena is evolving really nicely at the moment to support, I think, that, that core work area of FAO, the National Forest Inventory Design, Analysis and Reporting. So thank you very much. I, I invite you to, uh, to take what you need from our catalog of tools and platforms. They're all freely available and open. And I also invite you to request uh, technical assistance from us to help with the technology transfer. I think we have a very nice message from US Forest Service. Um, if we can uh, key that up, please. Thank you, IT. Should I push play? Or Hello, I'm Tracy Fraschino from the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Forest Service in the Forest Inventory and Analysis Program. 
I'm here to share my perspective and experience with the open forest tools for forest monitoring. So why are monitoring tools so important? Forest ecosystems are dynamic systems, and the data and tools that help us understand these systems are critical. They help us inform sustainable forest management practices and achieve the United Nations established sustainable development goals. Forest monitoring data allows us to quantify forest characteristics, such as the status, diversity, and historic and future trends. Monitoring data can also be used to track changes and to set benchmarks, standards, and guidelines for conservation and management practices. These strategic goals stress the importance of sharing available data and tools to generate reliable, timely, and repeatable estimates of forest attributes. With open source tools, such as the Open Forest suite of tools provided by the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization, we can more easily quantify and analyze our forests at a global scale and begin to make more informed decisions across the planet. Open source tools like Open Forest focus on flexibility, transparency, accessibility, and lower costs. Because open source tools are not proprietary, they, by definition, promote open collaboration, sharing, and innovation, thus improving accuracy and reliability. The Open Forest suite of tools provide a user-friendly platform for consistent data collection, analysis, and reporting, along with making accessible a wealth of remotely sensed data. This gives the needed advantages to those with less resources, allowing countries to focus on collecting high-quality data on the ground or from the sky, rather than focus on expensive tool development and maintenance. Plus, Open Forest was designed to help countries quantify forest change and degradation across their region. That means it was designed to help them meet specific reporting requirements of the IPCC and RED initiatives for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Together with the Global Forest Observation Initiative, they provide easy access to tools for measuring, analyzing, and validating data, increasing efficiency and accountability for developing countries. The USDA Forest Service Forest Inventory Analysis Program has been working in collaboration with Open Forest staff. The collaboration has, on a high level, led to valuable discussions about diverse forests and unique situations across the globe. We share goals to generate more precise estimates across different populations. We also share expertise to create reliable open source tools. This interchange has resulted in new techniques and development as we encounter and support different sampling designs, estimation strategies, and data sources. We plan to take advantage of the open forest tools for our estimation needs throughout the US. And we look forward to continuing the collaboration for years to come. I appreciate your attention and thanks for listening. Thank you very much to the US Forest Service. It's been a collaboration, I think, right from the start and uh, of mutual learning. And uh, we, yeah, we will continue to work closely with the US Forest Service. So now um, you're gonna hear a bit more about some of the really exciting work the Forestry Division is doing. And I would like to introduce Yelena Feingold, a Forestry Officer in the Forestry Division, to get you excited about some of the latest innovation in FAO CEPAL platform. Over to you, Yelena. Okay, okay, thank you so much, Belinda. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. Um, thank you, Julian, and thank you, colleagues. Thank you so much, Belinda. Yeah. Thank you for the wonderful presentation, Belinda, Hiro, and, um, and other colleagues, and thank you all for joining here. Um, today, I'd like to present CEPL and uncover some of the magic of this platform. Um, CEPL empowers countries, communities, and individuals to have access to powerful cloud, com cloud computing for monitoring forest and land resources. Let's start with a peek into the platform and uncover how the platform works for some of the work that Hiru showed and that I'll show in this presentation. 
Sepal is free and open source and enables anyone, anywhere to sign up and have access to satellite imagery over their country or any area in the world and perform analysis on that geospatial data to meet their needs and their context. It doesn't require any particular hardware or software, as Julian mentioned, it's a web platform, so you only need a computer or even smartphone and just an internet connection to access. The objectives of CEPL are to democratize data and break the barriers of access to that data and methodologies to process that data. To use CEPL, you don't need to be a researcher or a developer to have access to the latest science. And often, um, there, there's a lot of already existing great information provided by scientists out there, such as global maps on forest and deforestation. However, these global maps often don't meet local, don't match local circumstances and don't meet national definitions. So what we're doing with CEPL is making that data and the algorithms that are behind those global data sets accessible so people and governments can produce their own data. And CEPL, so CEPL doesn't provide any kind of ready-made statistics or maps, it's the users that then produce those maps and statistics, and they are the owners of them. And I think Hiro showed a really excellent example of this. And um, here I also have an example from Republic of Congo, and in many other countries are using CEPL, transforming these signals and images with local knowledge into maps and statistics of forest change to use in national forest monitoring systems and for red plus reporting. The tools in CEPL are co-developed with our partners and with countries. In Indonesia, um, there's, there have been great investments in restoring the precious peatlands, and we've been working with Indonesian government agencies to develop and pilot tools on monitoring the restoration of those peatlands by mapping soil moisture and um, groundwater levels over time and comparing them with field data from the peatlands to monitor the progress. And I know fires have been a, a particularly hot topic here at COFO and, um, and also globally, fires um, have a lot of significance. And in CEPL, we've developed some tools to monitor fires, combining uh, alerts of active fires with NICFI Planet's high resolution daily imagery. And we can see here an active fire burning, which we can detect, or we can go back in time and see historical fires, and then assess the impact of those fires and the effects of those fires by mapping the burn severity and land cover changes. Land degradation and monitoring is another important subject um, for um, reporting on SDG 15. And we've been working in Cox's Bazar refugee camp in Bangladesh to map um, the, some for, forest degradation, identify uh, forest degradation sites where they've then implemented restoration activities and sustainable forest management that then can be used by these extremely vulnerable communities. And importantly, in, um, in reversing land degradation, then it's important to prioritize where to have forest restoration activities. And in support of the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration, um, we've developed a decision support tool for forest res restoration planning called C-Plan, which uses both socioeconomic and biophysical geospatial data that represent restoration benefits and costs, 
And um, we have a really excellent um, example where Vietnam is piloting this tool and using it to create suitability maps that are an output of the tool, but using their local um, maps and data into that tool, um, which is very easy to use. And then taking those maps to the field to assess um, where to plan their forest restoration activities. So that's, um, that's the presentation on CEPL. And I'd just like to uh, finish it off saying that open technology like CEPL um, facilitates better data and informed decision making. And, um, and I invite you to try out this maybe not so magic platform, um, but I, I love that description, magic platform CEPL for yourself. The URL is there, CEPL.io. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Elena. It's incredible to see how the platform evolves for, for new use cases as, as, our, as our needs change, there's critical land monitoring needs forever evolving. I would now like to invite Remy Danuzio, another forestry officer. Uh, we've heard a lot this week about um, deforestation, degradation, and the drivers of those processes. And he has a really nice uh, use case for the Congo Basin. Over to you, Remy. Thank you, Julian. Um, Hi everybody, so I'm Remy, I'm also working with Yelena and, uh, and Julian in the forestry division. Um, we've, heard, um, we've heard a little bit about um, examples at the country level. I would like to give you uh, one short story about uh, how we can apply those tools at a larger scale, at regional level, and uh, how we've implemented this in, uh, in the Congo Basin. So. Um, some, somewhere around two and a half years ago, um, the Central African Forest Initiative, which is one of the, probably the biggest donor in, in the Congo Basin for the forestry sector, came to us and asked if we could, uh, if we could try to update the numbers and, uh, around deforestation and degradation and try to reach a consensus around uh, what were the driving forces behind those. And um, we, we told them if, if if you wanted to reach consensus on this, um, we, we could certainly help using tools that we have, but we, we would uh, need to have those tools used by the countries and produced locally. Um, and uh, we also insisted on uh, having a, an approach that would be inclusive of many different sectors. So academia, civil society, um, governments, and um, and, uh, and other actors. Um, so we embarked on this and we took up the challenge to produce um, uh, a system that could monitor deforestation and degradation at the regional level. So that's six countries we're talking about using those accessible and open source tools. Uh, so how did we do that in practice? Um, We've heard a lot about CEPAL and we've lo heard a lot about the open forest tools and yet again, this is where we, we use the tools. Um, so we, we kind of gathered all the good practices and experience we have, uh, we have had over the past 10 years of uh, setting up National Forest Monitoring System into a consistent package. Um, and, um, and we use the, those, those approaches that uh, Hyrule mentioned earlier that, uh, you know, that don't, don't use just like single maps and single discrete points in time, but use everything and look at the dense time series of satellite imagery. And by, by doing this, we, we managed to map both deforestation and degradation of forests. Uh, and we implemented all this within the CEPL platform uh, using the, the amazing cloud computing capabilities that are out there. Uh, we also uh, took a huge advantage of the Collectors Online uh, platform for calibration and uh, validation um, data collection. Um, so yeah, we, we really made sure that those tools were, um, were set up and uh, developed so that we could work at that scale, uh, which is again uh, around half a billion hectares uh, that are covering the, those six countries of the, of the Congo Basin. The second ingredient I think we put in this, uh, in this successful story is the use of um, unprecedented uh, detailed satellite imagery data through the NICFI program. NICFI is the um, Norwegian um, uh, climate initiative for forests and, um, 
uh, NICFI provided uh, through an exceptional contract with, uh, with Planet and other commercial partners, um, data to the, whole, to the whole world publicly available. Um, um, and the Planet data at, um, um, at really high spatial resolution, five meters, and really high cadence, every, basically um, updated daily, could help us identify drivers and validate very swift and, um, um, and dynamic um, processes such as degradation, especially in, in Congo Basin where things tend to, to recover quickly and to, and to regain. So things go quick and you need very, uh, very high cadence data to detect those things. Um, so that was the second ingredient, was uh, amazing data put into the, to the set. And the third one is uh, also echoing what we've been saying about digital public goods. It's, uh, it's really making sure that this was a, a country-driven process um, and, and through, through inclusion of many actors. Um, we started this, this activities in full during the pandemics um, era. And um, we actually took benefit of somehow, and we took the opportunity of being everybody locked down to fully develop and improve our online uh, didactic material, uh, ways to communicate with the government and the, and the agencies. And we set up a really virtual uh, environment to both do capacity building and to implement activities. And that also echoes with what Jairo was saying earlier. We you know, kind of feel like we're in the same room and uh, working together. And I think this somehow was uh, was a really good experience that uh, we could manage to deploy the tools completely, completely remotely. Um, and uh, when times got better, so that's the images you have at the, at the bottom, we, we managed earlier this year to go back to the field and start doing some, some proper field verification of some things and, and gathering social economic data, uh, which is also a good thing. Uh, so we had really active WhatsApp groups that are still active in, in the different countries. Uh, a very strong panel of, uh, of experts that helped with creating the data, validating it. Uh, and you can see here the distribution of, uh, of people in, in, the, in the countries. Right, um, so um, we set up those tools, we use them at large level, we produce maps, we produce statistics. Um, the results are currently under peer review. They are actually accessible as a blueprint, so feel free to, uh, to check it out um, on the internet. One of the very interesting things we have had is, uh, is a message on, the, on trends of deforestation and degradation. We also identify the um, drivers and uh, the very strong importance of the rural complex uh, in those drivers. I invite you to, to check them out and uh, and see what those results uh, look like. This is, no, I had another slide, but it looks like it's not there. Okay, well, I had another slide that, uh, that mentioned where all data is available, and we have a public website that is, um, that is showing the, all those, um, that is uh, providing accessibility to the data, to the protocols, to the results, to the recordings of the different um, uh, didactic sessions we had. Um, and uh, yeah, maybe we can post that out in the, in the chat somehow. Anyway, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Remy. Well, in the spirit of innovation, I think our next uh, presenter will, will talk more about a frontier technology, something that uh, is gonna become exciting for sustainable forest management in the next decade. And in this spirit of blockchain, I will pass straight to Jacqueline Bolt from Wageningen University in Research to get us excited about this potential. Thank you, Jacqueline. Thank you for this um, opportunity. This is actually my uh, only slide. Uh, and it's actually an invitation uh, to you to join our event on Blockchain for Forest this afternoon. It's from 2 to 5 uh, p.m. and you can still register. If you cannot make it to all the sessions, you can still access the information up to a month after the event. So you can download materials, briefs, um, publications. You can also watch back the recordings of this afternoon. So that's nice. Um, let me introduce myself. I'm Jacqueline Bolt. I'm a business innovator at Wageningen Environmental Research in the Netherlands. 
Um, I grew up in the Netherlands with a Brazilian mother who told me about my roots in Brazil, in the uh, Brazilian Amazon, where my grandfather used to have a rubber plantation. So she would use to tell me these stories about this flourishing industry and all these big houses in very remote areas of the jungle. Um, these have all vanished in the meantime. So these houses and this industry is no longer exist uh, in that area. And nature has taken over, which is maybe a good thing. Um, but the, the, the understanding of the value that forests have to offer has disappeared a little bit. Um, so that value is not only invisible sometimes for people in Europe, but also for people locally who've all moved to the cities and sometimes still have deeds to these lands somewhere in a drawer, but are not really attached to those forests that much anymore. So I wanted to, um, to work on showing this value, demonstrating this value, and um, sh demonstrating um, uh, monetary value also of forest and see, look for ways to attract financing for these forests and its products and services that it has to offer. So I became an environmental economist, uh, and I liked the opportunities of finance mechanisms, but our economic system is quite conventional and it moves quite slowly. Um, and it has a couple of flaws and, 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 and uh, troubles. Uh, a few years ago, I learned about blockchain technology. And through my research, I came to understand that blockchain can actually transform some of these fundamental problems that we are having in our um, conventional economic system. Um, so it has some characteristics and aspects that could be applied in nature conservation and in economics in general. The basis of economics is trust. Before anyone can engage in a transaction, they need to trust the other party. However, in reality, trust is almost never really present. Um, people may not know each other and the lack of trust may hamper uh, a, a transaction. And that is why we started to rely on external truth tellers. So truth tellers are organizations and people within organizations that can help us with trust for a transaction. So these can be organizations that can verify that a person has specific knowledge or they have financial capabilities to, to pay for something or they are the person that they say that they are. And we also have organizations that can provide uh, um, um, evidence of uh, craftsmanship or capabilities like a diploma or other forms of attestation. This now has turned into us trusting these organizations, these centralized organizations, which have also grown tremendously. They are bigger and more centralized. And we find that in uncertain time, with enough pressure, it is possible for these people working in these organizations to become susceptible to coercion, corruption, or censorship. Because we are all people, and people have flaws, of course. The most interesting thing about blockchain technology is that it is a new form of, of a governance mechanism. It allows for these transactions that I just mentioned, but without these requirements of trust. If a person can provide trust by working in a centralized organization and looking up a document or a data in a database or in an archive, this is also possible for a network of nodes. And nodes are basically computers anywhere over the world and people with computers that can join this network. So blockchain is compiled of a network of nodes, people all over the world joining this network. The difference is that a network is not susceptible to coercion, corruption, or censorship. And that is why we refer to blockchain technology as a trust-minimized governance mechanism. Uh, so it is useful to consider governance problems in economics or in nature conservation. So major uh, governance problems in forestry are, for example, uh, related to registration of land, uh, illegal deforestation, corruption, um, but also threats and dangers that are connected to people who want to take action in tackling illegal deforestation. It is not always too difficult to bribe a person who works within land registration, as some countries may have over three and a half thousand people working within these land registration databases. So it's not impossible to imagine finding one person within those thousands to, to bribe, maybe. If such 
land register would be open for everyone to see, where anyone can verify the validity of the ownership of land uh, independently, we have a much more robust and transparent system in land registration. Environmentalism in itself has become extremely dangerous for people involved. I see it myself in Brazil now, when we visit our lands, we have to go with a whole boat with military presence. Um, which is very different from 10 years ago. Within the last decade, over 1,700 environmentalists or people involved in environmentalism have been killed. So a more safe and anonymous network could help support local communities uh, that can act as local uh, forest ambassadors without putting them at risk. So we have verifiable, reliable data from the ground, but we can access it in a way that is safe and anonymous for them to provide. Um, so this improves the privacy and our safety, of course. <clears throat> uh, blockchain technology can, in addition to this, also provide mechanisms to reward these people for their efforts. Um, so there's incentive now to provide information, but there's also, uh, it is also more reliable and safer to do so for local communities. These um, incentive mechanisms, they may rely on programmable money, so cryptocurrency, for example. Currently, when an individual, for instance in Europe, uh, transfers money to an NGO who, who vows to work on sustainable forest management or forest restoration or forest conservation, this person financing this is not, cannot always be sure that this money will actually be spent on these promises that are being made by these organizations. So blockchain can then be used to create more transparent chains. When it is possible to program money, we can actually achieve upfront compliance. So nowadays when we have a transaction, afterwards we can check with an auditor, with a controller, whether this money has actually been spent the way we said it would be. But with upfront compliance, you ben can be ensured before the transaction takes place that it will actually be spent only on that goal, which is radically different. Um, this is called a smart contract. A smart contract is a self-executed agreement between parties. When, with these con contracts, it is possible to create requirements, and only when these requirements are met in agreement with those parties, then the transaction will go through. This is not only useful in chains uh, regarding forest preservation and protection, but also when reconsidering the flaws of current, uh, current carbon offset mechanisms, for instance. This could open the carbon offset market drastically. It could have many implications for, for the trading of carbon. Uh, two characteristics are often mentioned when we're talking about blockchain. This is uh, immutability and it is unstoppable. And it's very interesting because people all over the world, if you, if you have a computer, it's basically possible for you to enter this, this network and, and join and provide your data. Uh, it is borderless. Um, so this makes it very free from coercion, censorship and corruption and a really interesting form of uh, trust-minimized governance. The future of sustainable forest management may be a combination of all of those things. Blockchain may be very different in 10 years from now. Uh, we may know different uh, solutions. So it could be a combination of, uh, of different elements that I just uh, mentioned. Um, what is interesting about all these opportunities of, of blockchain is when you combine them, you can think of a forest as an organization. So if it is possible for a brand like Apple to become an organization, a legal entity that can take decisions, that can have a bank account, then why not apply this for a forest? Why could a forest not be an organization with a bank account? If a forest would have a bank account and could take decisions um, for its own sake, then it is possible for a forest to start expanding itself. Well, this sounds super futuristic, I uh, realize that, um, but people all over the world have actually started doing this. They have started to think about ways and implementing ways to give bank accounts to forests and to make it possible to understand forests better and to make it possible to take decisions for forests in an automated way. Um, what's also happening all over the world is that um, uh, we are thinking about natural resources as legal entities. 
Um, there's a forest, for instance, in uh, New Zealand that um, does its own governance. It owns itself and can take its own decisions. So these developments are actually in progress. And if you are interested to hear more about what's going on in the world, what these different initiatives are, then we fully welcome you to this afternoon to hear more about it or to watch back these sessions and become engaged. We have a chat room where you can uh, be involved in discussions, you can read these papers or you can meet with the, with the speakers. So we would definitely love to have you there because um, forests cannot program themselves and um, uh, algorithms and, and code does also not program itself. So we fully rely on um, professionals like IT developers, but also designers, philosophers, uh, forest specialists to bring together all this knowledge and come to sort of a consensus of what would work in that regard. So um, please join us because there's so much work to be done in this field. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jacqueline. What an inspirational way to end a great session. I, um, I know we have a session coming up straight after us, but um, can I invite any burning questions from the floor? Um, from what you've heard today, you've heard a lot, and I hope you've also become convinced that in fact foresters are amongst the most innovative people around. We've, we've, we've shown you so many amazing innovations that have been applied by countries, and the final presentation I think showed us what could be happening in the next 10 to 20 years. But I would welcome any questions from the floor. All quiet. So, I mean, yeah, exactly. I, we've seen, I think, today how the latest digital innovations from, from FAO, from our partners, from the countries, are really helping countries achieve their forest goals. I mean, that is our, that is our end point. We don't play around with digital tools for fun, although it is a lot of fun. We want to enable people to do, to do what they need to do, if it's restoration, if it's reducing deforestation and degradation, if it's doing sustainable forest management. And I think today we've seen, we've seen evidence of that. We, we've seen that it's happening. I mean, I found the presentation from Indonesia really inspiring, the fact that they, as their capabilities for forest monitoring improved, they were able to act and reduce their deforestation, and now they have this ambitious follow 2030 plan that is re reducing deforestation and restoring on a massive scale and underpinned by data and digital innovation. So I hope you leave this session as inspired as I am and uh, I would like to warmly thank our panelists for joining us today and thank you all for coming. I realize we are in parallel to ongoing COFO discussions, but um, thank you all and wishing you all, all a great uh, continuation of your day. Thank you. <laughs>